Hey everybody and welcome back to Linear Algebra Online. So the plan for today is to talk about something that honestly is probably the most core concept in a first course in Linear Algebra and that's something called an uh, invertible matrix. So um, the notion of an inverse is what I'm talking about there and it's basically linked to an entire fundamental theorem of linear algebra that actually has all these different parts to it. So this is something that you're going to see different versions of. Um, this is one from way later in the book, um, but <clears throat> there is honestly versions where um, as we go, you'll kind of learn like, I think the first one you see is like A through E, um, and then like it adds more and more and more as you go. But these are kind of almost like units that we study um, in the course as we go. And uh, it turns out that basically what this theorem is saying is that all these different things are really just saying the same thing. That's the idea. Um, and the very first one is that A is invertible, which just means that A has an inverse, basically. Um, that there's a matrix. Uh, what this really just means is that there exists a inverse. We write it that way, just such that um, A times A inverse also, and here it actually a matrix multiplication would be um, commutative, but basically there's such a thing as an inverse, which when you multiply it by the matrix, you get the identity matrix. Um, and it would always just be, in this case, you know, the way the theorem's written, it's like an n by n um, identity matrix. So um, you'll learn that basically all these different things are equivalent to that, but this, this fundamental theorem of invertible matrices, which is honestly practically what you just need to make sure that you understand by the end of a linear algebra class, is all built upon the very first thing is A is invertible, and that's like what we're going to talk about today. So Hopefully you kind of see that it's probably important because it's literally the first item in this really important theorem. So one of the very um, important kind of first things I want to just do is show that um, an inverse is unique. So um, the inverse, um, to show something like unique, you basically do the trick that we've talked about before where you actually suppose it's not. So I'm going to start off and basically... Um, I'm going to suppose there exists a, um, we'll do, we'll just do a prime and a double prime, two inverses for a, okay? Um, so this basically means um, then by definition, I have that a, a, prime equals a prime a equals a or sorry uh, i wanted to write is equal to i and a a double prime equals a double prime a which also equals i okay so i'm just going to start off um and i'm going to have uh just a prime here and i think i could fit this on one line i'm basically going to show that a prime equals a double prime, and so the things are not actually unique, is the idea. So, a prime equals a times the identity matrix, or sorry, a prime times the identity matrix, but the identity matrix is um, a double prime times a, by my assumption above, right? So, I'm just subbing out this, this, and then I could commute an inverse like that, so I could do... Um, you know, that's the same as a, a double prime. And then now I'm just going to reorder the parentheses just to kind of group them a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> and so now um, this thing is also an identity, right? So, oops, I wanted the identity over there. So then we have i a double prime and i a double prime is a double prime. Um, so, uh, we see a prime equals a double prime, and there cannot exist, um, a second inverse. Hence, inverses are unique. All right. Um, so that's just a very important thing. Basically, if you find an inverse to a matrix, 
it's going to be unique. Uh, there's only one of them. So the first way that, um, kind of simplest way, I think, that we're going to first kind of study an inverse and how to find it um, is kind of just building off of our notion of what we're doing when we solve a matrix. So um, to motivate this, uh, just consider the following system. So as a matrix, this thing would just turn into, and then if you RREF this thing, you get... And so what we basically just did there is we solved for X, Y, and Z. Um, and a common way to kind of write this problem is really just like this. Here what we got is basically a matrix times like a variable vector equaling this 4, negative 5, 13 that the system here equals. Um, and so when we solve a matrix problem like this, what we're really doing is we're basically saying like, you know, some matrix times like a vector x equals like a different vector, like one, like a constant vector. Um, maybe I'll just do like um, c or something. So that's basically like what we're doing when we solve a system with a with a matrix. Um, and so an analog to that idea is basically if we take um, this thing, right? We want a matrix A, or sorry, X. We want X so that if we multiply A times X, we get I. So we're basically going to kind of take this idea and we're going to steal it um, and like write a matrix problem like this, which kind of does something similar, but instead of just a vector here, we're going to literally have um, an entire... Sorry, I mean, instead of a vector here, right, like over here, we're going to have it, we want it to equal the identity matrix. So we're going to have a matrix equaling a matrix in a sense. And so as um, we basically form this, what I like to call a super augmented matrix. And this is what I mean by that. All right, so this thing, basically what we're doing is this is my A, A, right? And... I'm trying to solve for like a uh, variable vector, but really this is going to be like my inverse, right? And it needs to equal not a um, vector, but it needs to equal literally the identity. So just like here, it's kind of implied that there's this X, Y, Z that's like hidden in there. Buried in here, there's sort of a, you know, A inverse that I'm going to be solving for. So what you can just do now is you can do like RREF, you can get this. And what we just did with that is basically now we know um, this has to be my inverse. Um, it's just like when we solve this system over here, and we get the X, the Y, the Z, we solve for that. We basically just solve for an entire matrix in there. That's, you know, my X, my capital X is like a matrix. Um, and, you know, the answer when we do these kind of problems structurally, it always ends up over here. It's just like we have to take this whole thing as the inverse. So um, this thing has an inverse and it is literally this matrix. And if you do, um, you know, you should test it. If you do A times that uh, A inverse I just circled, you really will get um, the three by three identity. So that is one way that you can find an inverse and kind of... Um, can do this quick on a calculator. Um, this is just another example to kind of show you what would happen if it didn't work out so nice. So if you make the super augmented matrix that I got there, and then you RREF this one. So you get that thing. And the reason that this one doesn't exist is the last... Um, like row here, right? So what this is, the issue is, is that you've got, um, you don't have over here the nice identity structure. You basically need that in order to know like that there's a solution. Just like when you solve a, um, you know, system of equations with RAF, if you get this kind of thing, right, there would be like infinitely many solutions and there it would mean something a little different than what we're doing here. But um, there is only one inverse to this matrix right here, if it exists, right? 
And what we just basically found is something that would kind of look like there should be multiple because you kind of got like this row of zeros, but then some other stuff. You basically have something that just doesn't exist. It doesn't work. It's kind of like when you have zero equals one on the bottom row and something um, that is something that's not true. Um, and so this bottom row implies that like A inverse just does not exist. Um, and so this is one way you can do it. You can honestly also just do, um, you can go to, this is like um, some of the nicer calculators definitely, but if you just raise A to the negative one, um, and that is something that your calculator will let you do, then uh, you're good. It exists, but, and you'll actually like, get it. And so you should test that with uh, this one too. Um, but I wanted you to see this method just because it's kind of famous. This is something called the Gauss-Jordan method for computing an inverse. Um, and it's just kind of like a good way to kind of visualize a connection back to systems of equations, which I feel like we haven't talked about too much. And honestly, that still is at the core of so much of what we're doing right now. So what I just want to finish up with today are um, these different properties of an inverse. Um, so a lot of them are kind of quick, short, but like all very important. And I just want to like prove each one. So all of them right here, you can notice um, they either start off with just one matrix is invertible um, or they give you a scalar or there's like two that um, uh, are invertible matrices. I think that's the only one actually. So the rest of them are all just A is invertible, A is invertible. And when you see this in math, all this basically means if you have that in a theorem in linear algebra or anything else, then basically what you have to work with is that there exists this A inverse such that A times A inverse equals A inverse times A equals the identity. That's basically, whoops, um, that's what you have to work with in basically all these problems. And from that, you should be able to prove all these things. So um, I'm going to go through them now, but... If I was you, I would stop right here and I would try to think about how um, you can go and like prove these things. All right, so the first one. So um, if A is invertible, then A inverse is invertible and the inverse of the inverse is back to A. So this one's pretty intuitive, um, but basically um, you just want to show that uh, A, whoops, a inverse times some matrix equals um, the identity, which also equals so that same matrix times A inverse, right? That's just what it means for A inverse to be invertible. And there's not much to honestly say here. You can just be like, um, you know, by definition, uh, A invertible means there exists a inverse such that a, a inverse equals a inverse a, which equals the identity. So a um, satisfies uh, x in the uh, above equation. Right? And we wanted to show that um, the that A inverse is invertible, which X shows that part, so that's the invertible part. Um, and we showed that the inverse to A inverse is A. So we also did that. So A is this, A is this inverse to the inverse that satisfies this equation, which means that A inverse is invertible. All right. Um, so second one. If A is an invertible matrix and C is a non-zero scalar, then C times A is an invertible matrix, and C times A inverse is 1 over C times A to the negative 1, um, A inverse. So we basically need to show that C A is invertible, first and foremost, and that the thing that um, acts as the inverse is this. All right, so here... Um, so I want to start off and show that C A is invertible. So, um, um, so we need to show that C A times some matrix equals 
the identity, right? Um, and if you know that C is a non-zero scalar, um, then you can do, you can divide by it, right? So that's just a scalar. So you have AX now equals one over C times, whoops, not X, um, times I. I'm going to just write then equivalently. All right. So now um, I'm going to use my definition of A being invertible. So A invertible implies there exists A inverse such that A inverse times X equals, so I'm just doing left multiplication um, by uh, A inverse, right? And... Um, Oh, I think I just dropped. I wanted an A in there. <laughs> there we go. Um, and then I'm just going to do, so, or equivalently, the A inverse um, X. So the A inverse times A is going to get simplified to the identity. So then um, X would equal A inverse 1 over C times I. And then you could just reorder that thing. You could pull the scalar out. So you could do 1 over C, A inverse I. Um, so the, the scalars can always just be pulled out in front like that. So um, this does it. So basically we showed, um, we showed uh, there exists X such that C, A times X um, equals I. And that inverse is 1 over C, A inverse. Uh, I don't need the I. Um, that can just go away. So that's it. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of all feel like this if you ever ask to show that something is invertible. Some of the ones coming up here in a second have a few more little tricks. So, But the first two there look kind of the same. So um, I wanted you to see this one too because it's kind of that... Um, like socks and shoes thing. Maybe kind of write that again. Um, socks and shoes. So we saw this with the transpose and it still applies to the inverse. So if you have a product AB inverse, then the inverse of that thing works out to be B inverse A inverse. Okay. Um, so this one you have A and B are invertible. Um, you want to show that AB is invertible and show that the inverse is this. So um, start off, so we want, um, we need to show that AB times something equals that something times AB equals the identity, all right? So maybe I'll kind of do that. And, um, you know, last time I kind of worked it out with uh, the something on the right. Maybe this time I'll work it out with the something on the left. Honestly, like you can do these kind of either way. Um, and it's probably best to show both of them work out, like show that X, the thing I'm solving for, which is going to be this, satisfies this and this. Um, but I'm just going to kind of un uh, use this one to show it here. So um, so we have X, A, B equals I. Um, and so um, I'm just going to write, given that, um, we can multiply on the right by B inverse, which we know exists by our assumption. All right, um, and get um, basically X, A, B, B inverse equals B inverse. Uh, whoops, I dropped it. I, can't, I don't know why I'm doing that. So, B, B inverse. Or, um, basically, I can cancel this, right? And just get um, X, A equals B inverse, right? Then I could do something similar. So, uh, we know A inverse exists. So... X, A, A inverse would equal B inverse A inverse. And you have to do it, if you're doing like right multiplication on this side, you have to do it on this side. It's 
not going to be equal if you stick the A in front of the B. It has to be all the way on the right. Um, and that matters because the sizes and the matrices and things like that with the multiplication. Um, then I'm going to just write or equivalently. Basically here, I'm going to do the same kind of trick, cancel this off, and get X equals B inverse A inverse. Um, and then, you know, you can just kind of sum it up from there. Uh, this shows there exists an inverse to AB, and it is B inverse, oops, B inverse A inverse. So basically, I just want you to see the, the socks and shoes things pops back up. It shows up a lot in linear algebra, but um, yeah, the inverse to a product is basically that reverse product, and you just stick inverses on there. And that's how you can go ahead and cancel them off. All right. Um, this one uses transpose. So if A is invertible, then A transpose is invertible, and the tra A transpose's inverse is A inverse transpose. Okay? So you should always think about these things, too, and sometimes, like, you know, things like this are kind of weird, but... Um, this should look kind of familiar to um, something we did uh, when we did transpose properties, too. So we saw something kind of similar to this. So hopefully it's not too weird, but um, yeah. All right, so for this one, um, I'm going to do it kind of structurally a little bit different. So um, I'm just going to start off kind of with this A transpose, and I'm going to multiply it by A inverse transpose, okay? And... I'm just going to say, so by transpose properties, right, um, we know that um, this basically uses, maybe I'll even write it here. So this uses the, like, A, B transpose equals, it's like the socks and shoes thing. Um, so I would get that this is the same as A inverse A, all of that transpose. And then I could say um, that this is the same as the identity, transpose, but the identity is symmetric, and so that's just the identity, okay? Um, and then, and so some of this was, um, I, I'm not doing such a formal proof here, I feel like I'm getting a little lazy, but, um, you know, this is because of the um, assumption that uh, A is invertible, right? And so this is, again, just because I is symmetric, All right? And then you could also do something like this. You could say, um, also note A inverse transpose A transpose would equal then A A inverse transpose for that same socks and shoes principle. And then that's the identity transpose, which is the identity. Um, so... Note that, like, um, uh, A inverse transpose satisfies uh, A transpose X, which equals uh, X A transpose equals I. So um, A inverse transpose is the inverse to A transpose, and hence... A transpose is invertible. So that one, I'm kind of rushing through these for the sake of time. Um, definitely would need to clean this up a little bit. You probably want to add a few words in here, but that is the idea of the proof. All right. One more here. So very similar, um, but also different. So I just want you to... Um, well, let me just read this thing first. So... Um, a is invertible again, and from that, you can show that A to the N is invertible for all non-negative integers N, and A to the N to the negative 1, the inverse of that thing, is A inverse to the N, okay? So it's I want you to see the similarity between the transpose one and this one. So it's like the N is the T, right? And this one's kind of cool because it uses induction. And so, again, I really um, 
if I was you, I would try these things. So I gave you a big hint there saying that it uses induction. Um, but you should like pause and try these things. But I'm going to jump into it right now. All right. So the base case is kind of silly, like a lot of them are. Um, so for non-negative uh, integers means that we start at um, n equals 0. All right. So uh, we have that a to the 0 um, to the negative 1 equals, um, so we need to show that this equals uh, this thing right here, all of that to the 0 power, right? So um, a to the 0 power is the identity, all right? And so the inverse of the identity is um, the identity, and that then equals a inverse raised to the zero power. Um, so yeah, it's done. And you know, to do to talk about this step, you might want to add a little something because um, you would want to kind of show, um, you know, for this, you could say something like note um, I um, satisfies the equation. I x equals x i equals i, right? So if you stick i in there, then you can see that i is its own inverse, basically. All right. So for the inductive like hypothesis step, so we're going to um, assume a to the k inverse equals a inverse to the k, and show that a to the k plus 1 inverse equals a inverse to the k plus 1. All right, so this one's pretty quick. Um, uh, I'm going to always start with this part, and I'm going to show this. That's the idea with induction again. So um, note that uh, a, uh, we'll do a to the, uh, we'll just do it like this. A to the K, A times A to the K equals A to the K plus 1. So A, A to the K, all of that to um, the inverse of that equals A K inverse times A by um, basically property C. So meaning this one, right? It's the socks and shoes one. Then... Um, Actually, I'm going to try to squeeze that in here. So by C, and I get this back. Okay. So then, um, now I'm just going to kind of crank through, um, like, a few things. So by our assumption, A, K, inverse, A would then equal A, inverse to the K, A, Oh, I dropped an inverse there. And I need one here, and I need one here. There we go. Then, um, now I've got A inverse, right, to the K. And then i got another A inverse. So now I can multiply these, and I have A inverse to the K plus 1. And that proves it. So I'm running out of time very rapidly, so I have to finish this thing off. Um, but... That is what I wanted to show, right? So it's basically just one of those where, again, you peel off a power and then you use the previous, um, you know, assumption step right here. And then, um, you know, that, that's done right here uh, and here, basically. And then, um, then you just use, like, you recombine them, basically. And now you've got K plus one of them. And all these proofs that I kind of went through, I needed to do kind of fast, but... Um, honestly, you'd need to, if you're really formally writing these up, you would make sure that you want to like clean these up nice and neat. So they are in the book. Um, I think they're, I have the book here. Let me just check. So yeah, they're around like page, uh, 168. If you want to see, they got some of them, not all of them in there, but, um, you can read them a little bit more clear if you want them.